Alrighty, so uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is John Stoltz, and I work for Lenaro. Uh, basically, this is going to be my talk, Andrew Kringle Upstreaming, uh, an overview and status. Um, so just an outline of uh, what I'm going to talk about. So we're going to basically go through uh, all the components of the Android kernel patch set and do an overview of it. Uh, we're going to talk about the status of what's made it upstream and what's still out of tree. Um, and then finally, going to talk a little bit about why upstreaming is important. Um, so first, the overview of the Android kernel patch set. Um, basically, the Android kernel patch set is the modifications that the uh, Google Android developers made to uh, the Linux kernel um, in order to uh, basically support the uh, Android platform at features that they needed. Um, now, for each, uh, uh, basically, Nexus device, uh, there's a huge set of patches um, that uh, changes from device to device. And uh, these are all in the, uh, basically on AOSP, um, basically called the device git trees. And I'm not really going to cover those. Um, I'm going to instead cover the uh, less uh, device specific uh, patch set that's in the uh, common.git tree on AOSP. Um, and basically, uh, these are the, uh, this is the functionality that basically all of the device trees are uh, um, built upon. Um, so I'm going to use this uh, little butcher's diagram to kind of uh, uh, help us go through uh, all the different components as we uh, do the overview. Um, so first of all, the core platform components. Um, these are basically uh, the components that are absolutely necessary for the Android platform to function. Uh, without them, uh, basically the Android environment will not run or you won't be able to interact with it. Um, these functions are uh, Binder. Now, Binder, I guess there was an earlier uh, a talk on that uh, by itself, and um, I think almost everyone was there because I couldn't even make it in through the door. Uh, but Binder is uh, basically the IPC layer uh, that's pretty core in Android. Um, basically, since all applications run as different users, uh, basically, if they want to initiate any communication between applications, they need to use Binder. Um, it's basically uh, the framework upon which uh, larger Android uh, uh, Concepts like intents and uh, content providers are built upon. Um, we also have AshMem. Uh, AshMem is the anonymous shared memory system. Um, basically, it provides to applications uh, file descriptors that allow them to map in basically anonymous memory. Um, those file descriptors can then be passed through Binder to other applications for them to share that uh, memory. Um, it's very similar to basically uh, TempFS uh, file descriptors, um, but uh, it kind of are unlinked to TempFS files. Um, the thing that's nice about it is it avoids uh, the problem of having a tempfs mount that applications could write to and basically take up memory um, since uh, that's a RAM-based file system. Um, and so basically it kind of cleans up after itself when the last application that uh, has a handle on that file descriptor closes. Um, another cool feature with AshMem is that it provides uh, an ability for applications to basically unpin chunks of that uh, anonymous memory. Um, and this allows the kernel to then uh, basically reclaim it if it needs. Uh, and this allows for basically um, uh, kernel triggered uh, application cache purging. Or, uh, yeah, so it, it's pretty neat. Um, next up is logger. Um, logger is basically a uh, in kernel memory uh, log buffer. It's very similar to dmessage, except for it allows for applications to uh, write to it. Um, in order to avoid one noisy application flooding the entire log, they kind of break it up into chunks, and so you have you know, the system uh, uh, logs separated from the application logs. Um, finally here, the monotonic event timestamps. Um, basically, this provides, uh, uh, I guess, so with Android, uh, you have a lot of gestures, and those gestures are basically a series of input events over time. And so you can kind of imagine that the problems that could happen if you set the time of day uh, you would end up having basically a gesture uh, possibly end before it began. Um, and so that's very confusing. So in order to resolve this, basically, they changed all of the uh, input event timestamps to use clock monotonic, which is a great solution uh, for them, but basically breaks the uh, kernel ABI. So that's a little problematic. Um, next up, we've got the uh, power and performance improvements. Um, these are basically items that are not uh, absolutely critical for applications to run, but basically are critical for devices. Uh, you're not going to want to uh, uh, have an Android app, uh, device without them. Um, these are the strong shoulders and back of the bug droid there. Um, we've got uh, probably one of the best well-known uh, Android changes is the wake lock infrastructure. Uh, this infrastructure basically serializes uh, against races that can happen between wake up, uh, wake up events and suspend. Um, when this was first submitted to uh, the Linux kernel mailing list, it created a big controversy, um, mostly because um, these races can occur really anywhere throughout the kernel stack, all the way from the interrupt layer through the, uh, basically the uh, driver core, through the actual uh, interfaces and into user land. And so it requires kind of this chaining of these lock structures um, 
throughout that layer and was just not very uh, pretty at the time. Um, I guess uh, connected with the wake locks uh, is also alarm dev, um, which basically allows applications to trigger uh, events in the future um, that will wake up the system if it's suspended. So this is useful uh, for things like, um, you know, if you have maybe an email client that polls every 15 minutes uh, checking email, it's able to wake up the system and check email, uh, similar for calendars. Um, it can trigger uh, alarms at certain events. Um, we also have the low memory killer. Um, now, because with Android applications, they usually aren't uh, explicitly quit by the user, um, we need something to kind of go around and garbage collect old applications. Um, the low memory killer basically monitors memory on the kernel, um, and basically when it starts to get a little tight, we'll kill applications in uh, basically LRU order. Um, now, it's a little redundant because in the kernel, we already have the out of memory killer, but uh, basically that only triggers when the kernel is absolutely out of pages. Um, so it, Basically, you know, we've, once it's flushed the page cache and there's no other pages that can be found. Um, so you can see some pretty negative performance impacts when you hit that out of memory uh, point. And so the low memory killer is a little, uh, I guess, preemptive and it, it, it acts before we run into those performance problems. Um, and then we have the interactive CPU frequency governor. Uh, it's basically uh, kind of part of the code that manages the speed of the processor. Um, Basically, uh, uh, it's different than the other CPU frequency governors in the kernel in that uh, while it tries to keep the CPU in a low power uh, state as much as it can, any time that uh, the user interacts with the device, it maxes out the CPU immediately. Uh, that way you get good interactive uh, response. So next up are the platform debugging features. Uh, these are the hands and feet of the bug droid because you have to kind of feel out problems and then stomp the bugs. Um, so there we've got uh, the Android gadget driver. Um, basically, this is a, a gadget driver that it, it allows uh, the device to basically multiplex a number of different uh, uh, interfaces over a single USB connection. Um, it can also be configured dynamically at runtime, so it can do things like ADB as well as uh, file transfer protocols like MTP or PTP, um, tethering protocols like ACM, uh, etc. Uh, we have the FIQ debugger, which is basically a low-level uh, kernel debugger um, that uses ARM's uh, fast interrupt mode. Um, I guess the kind of most interesting part to, on this one is that if you have the right cable, uh, you can actually plug into the headphone jack on uh, some devices, and you can get a serial port that gives you uh, access to the FIQ debugger. So it's very useful if you're uh, uh, debugging a, a problematic device. Um, we have the RAM console and persistent RAM. Um, this is basically infrastructure there. The kernel puts aside at a specific physical location in memory, um, basically uh, the console messages and records them. Um, this is helpful because if the system crashes and it's rebooted, uh, you're able to basically uh, capture that data and be able to store the log messages. This is useful because on ARM uh, devices, frequently they don't reset uh, their memory uh, when they're rebooted. Um, then we have the key reset driver. Uh, this is basically kind of control alt delete for phones. Uh, basically allows you to uh, set up a key combination that when pressed for long enough uh, will trigger a file system sync and basically a reset. Uh, the ETM and ETB improvements. Um, this is the, the embedded trace module and embedded trace buffer. Um, on some ARM SOCs, basically it allows for uh, coordinated logging between possibly different OSs that are running on the same SOC. So things like if you have a cellular modem um, that's running some micro OS and Linux, uh, they're basically both able to uh, uh, do logging into a hardware buffer um, uh, and be serialized properly. Uh, and then finally, the Goldfish emulator support. Um, this is basically uh, changes to the Linux kernel to support the uh, Goldfish emulator, which is the emulator you see when you uh, write your first Android application and uh, start up, uh, uh, it's very, very slow. Um, so then we've got the networking changes for the little bug droids antennas there. Um, we've got the paranoid networking framework. Um, now this is kind of a, I don't know, for Android it's kind of an elegant hack. Um, basically since Android applications all run as separate users, um, they have a special group that uh, some of those applications can be a member of. And then in the kernel, basically, it checks to see if the current task is a member of the networking group or not, and it allows it uh, access to networking. Um, it's, it's a very small patch. It's kind of elegant, but it's uh, not something that could ever really go upstream. Um, we also have the net filter changes, which are changes that basically allow for uh, improved accounting of uh, what applications are using data. Um, then we have the Bluetooth improvements, which are basically improvements to error handling and uh, specific Bluetooth modes. 
Um, and then the BCMHD driver, uh, which is basically a uh, Wi-Fi driver, driver that's uh, very common on devices. Um, so this is a vendor kind of OEM uh, drop that lands in the Android kernel periodically. Um, next up is the graphics infrastructure. Uh, for those, we've got Ion and Sync. Um, Ion is basically a graphics memory manager. Um, it provides uh, access to different pools of memory uh, that can satisfy various constraints of the hardware. Um, so for example, if you have uh, a, a camera that's basically recording images and then you want to use the GPU to uh, put some nostalgic filter upon them and then send it off to the compositor to get rendered to the screen, um, we want to avoid copying uh, memory through that uh, path. And so we want to use the same memory um, the same buffer basically that entire way. Um, one of the problems is that there may be specific constraints that the hardware requires or various pieces of hardware require. So you might have something like the camera driver that requires that uh, all of the buffers that it accesses are physically contiguous. Um, and so basically ION manages different pools of memories like contiguous memory or uh, carve out or uh, kernel memory uh, that can be used to satisfy those constraints. Um, after that we have the sync driver. Um, this is basically uh, a way to serialize uh, uh, different, or coordinate different drivers uh, so they can serialize around events. Um, sounds a lot like a mutex, and uh, it basically allows, um, it allows uh, the system to be able to expose things like hardware mutexes, which some GPUs support. Um, this allows you to do things like uh, uh, time drawing uh, with screen refreshes, and this is part of uh, the Project Butter uh, effort. And we kind of have a catch-all uh, for miscellaneous items. Um, there's the Android battery driver. Um, this is sort of a meta driver. It's a, a kind of regular power supply driver, but it also has uh, enablements for wake locks as well as uh, uh, uses alarm timers to uh, wake up and check uh, thermal constraints uh, uh, when charging. Um, there's input drivers, so uh, specific uh, synaptic drivers, for instance, and uh, other tweaks like improving or uh, adding wake lock support um, through the input layer. Um, the switch class and the time GPIO, uh, these are for things like physical switches and vibration buzzers and phones. Um, and then we have the MMC tweaks, which again are mostly error handling fixes and uh, wake lock enablement. And then further, even smaller changes all over. Um, so this uh, is the little vestigial tail on the bug droid um, for deprecated items. Um, so these are basically things that you may have heard of that are no longer in the uh, uh, current uh, OSP common tree. Um, there's PMEM. This is basically kind of a precursor to ION, so ION's gone on and replaced this. Uh, early suspend is also gone, and it's been basically, uh, user land's been reworked, so it's unnecessary now. Um, and so it, uh, I think with Jellybean 4.2, it's not needed. Um, APANIC, uh, I believe this had a lot of duplication with the RAM console work, and that's why it was <laughs> removed, uh, but I'm not totally sure on that one. Um, and then YAFS to file system, this is basically a file system for raw NAND support. Um, and while it's still actually in the tree, uh, not many devices, I believe, use this, uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if it disappeared at some point. Um, so now, that sort of is the entire uh, overview portion of this talk. Uh, so now I'm going to go through the upstream status. So we're going to lead with the good news. Um, Basically, these are items that are already upstream uh, properly in the kernel. So we've got wake locks, which I think is a, given the, the, the firestorm that that created, that's uh, basically a huge accomplishment. And a lot of credit goes to uh, Raphael uh, uh, Wasaki, uh, who's the power management maintainer, um, and Arve at uh, Google, who uh, in it wrote wake locks initially, um, basically collaborating together and uh, managing to uh, basically create uh, what are wake up sources in the kernel. And uh, then extend that so that it was sufficient uh, to provide uh, the semantics that wake locks needed. Um, it even includes a, a wake lock compatible user land API, so applications didn't need to change. Um, for monotonic event, event timestamps, um, basically the, um, the change that the Android guys was very simple but wasn't appropriate for upstreaming because it broke uh, the kernel ABI. And so we uh, basically extended uh, the input uh, layer with an ioctal that allows applications to select which timestamp they want to use or which clock event they or which clock source they want to use uh, for uh, uh, their event stamps. Um, and with uh, Jellybean 4.2, they're now using this, so this uh, um, is, is quite nice. Um, 
The RAM console and persistent memory, this is more recently uh, merged uh, via the PStore and RAM Oops uh, infrastructure, which was basically very similar uh, infrastructure that was there already upstream for enterprise servers. Um, and then the switch class has finally uh, uh, gone upstream uh, as the XCON driver. Um, so now there's also the staging directory upstream. Um, and this is basically an area in the kernel where drivers that don't meet kind of the uh, expected quality guidelines are able to uh, be merged upstream and sort of uh, improved iteratively until they can be uh, uh, basically merged properly. Um, up there we have Binder, we have Ashman, we have Logger, uh, Low Memory Killer, the Alarm Dev, uh, the Android Gadget Driver, although it's been renamed as the CCG Driver. Um, also, uh, I just got told today that apparently uh, there's some portions that are missing, so it actually doesn't have ADV support. Um, and then the Time GPIO. Now, while all of these will eventually need to continually be reworked and merged properly upstream, um, the nice thing is that because these are in the staging directory, that uh, you know, today you can basically boot an Android environment on a vanilla Linux kernel. So for items that are uh, currently in development, um, we've got the FIQ debugger. Um, currently, uh, I guess Anton Vorontsov has spent some time uh, integrating that with uh, KDB. Um, we've got a good number of that, a good chunk of that's already upstream. Um, further changes are queued for 3.9, I believe. Um, and then there's still some portions that uh, need some maintainer review, but uh, hopefully that will uh, be all upstream fairly soon. Um, the key reset driver, uh, Matthew Poirier has been working on that as well. Um, he's got some of the functionality queued for 3.9, uh, but it still needs uh, uh, some more work, things like uh, adding timeouts and uh, being able to sync the file system before resetting. Um, and it's being integrated with the SysRQ driver. Um, the low memory killer, this is another uh, bit of work that Anton Vorontsov has been working on. Um, basically, uh, he's trying to uh, create basically an interface that the kernel will provide to user land that will give notifications if we start uh, seeing memory pressure. Um, and this allows basically us pushing uh, the killing decision out to user land so that uh, you know, user land could maybe take uh, other actions like notifying the applications to shut down um, and save state. Um, it's still kind of in discussions. It, it's one of those things that keeps on seeming like it's almost ready to go upstream, but then somebody suggests one more change. Um, Ashmem's unpinning functionality. This is something that uh, I'm actually working on. It's, uh, uh, again, this is the functionality that allows uh, basically uh, applications to have uh, kernel triggered uh, cache purging. Um, and uh, I'm trying to make it more generic and pushing it as what I call volatile ranges. Um, unfortunately, I, I keep on having to push it further and further into the VM layer, so it's uh, been a little slow going, so that's still something that's uh, being worked on. Um, and then also the Goldfish platform support. Uh, Alan Cox, I believe, has been submitting uh, this for staging, and I, I'm not sure if it's queued for 3.9, but it might be. I, I believe in, in the near future that should be uh, headed upstream to staging. So there's still also uh, quite a bit of work to be done. Um, we've got... Uh, you know, basically the, the graphics changes, both ION and SYNC, uh, neither of those have been submitted upstream or uh, sent to staging. Um, there's some work in the community that's uh, trying to basically uh, enable similar functionality, but I'm not sure if that effort, those efforts, uh, things like uh, the DMA buffs, uh, fe or DMA buff fences, yes. Um, I'm not sure if the, that will be sufficient functionality to replace uh, uh, what Android needs. Um, so hopefully uh, we'll be working on this more in the near future. Um, the interactive CPU frequency governor, this was actually submitted upstream, um, but was knacked by the scheduler maintainers. Um, and the reason for this is because basically they want to kind of merge the CPU frequency governor uh, logic at some point sort of cl closer with the scheduler itself. Um, it's kind of a pain to have these kind of two separate systems, one deciding where, pro where, 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 where processes should run and then a separate system deciding kind of what the speed of those processors should be. Um, the net filter changes and paranoid networking. Um, so the net filter changes were submitted upstream um, and got a fair amount of feedback. There weren't any major objections, basically just a lot of cleanups. Um, so that's, some, that's an area that basically just needs some... Uh, work to uh, clean up and get uh, those patches merged. Um, the paranoid networking, now that's not something that is really appropriate for upstreaming since it is such a very Android-specific kind of hack. Um, that said, 
it's been suggested that the network namespaces uh, would be sufficient in order to uh, provide the same functionality. Uh, unfortunately, it would require a fair amount of uh, heavy lifting uh, to change the Android user land to make use of that functionality. Um, so I'm not sure if that's uh, likely to happen in the near term. Um, the alarm dev, uh, basically, uh, uh, while it's still in staging, um, much of its functionality has been properly merged upstream. Um, it's basically just the uh, raw dev alarm uh, driver, uh, that basically the, the interface that needs to be preserved at the moment. Um, this interface is very similar to the existing timer FD interfaces. Um, so basically folks have suggested that we kind of merge these at some point. Um, the difficult decision there is basically if we do merge them, um, older applications that depend on the uh, alarm dev interface uh, might break. Um, so trying to figure out what the right approach is there is uh, something to be decided. Um, the ETM and ETB improvements, uh, those both, or I guess those have been uh, um, submitted uh, upstream. Um, one of the problems there, though, is that the, the maintainer of that code has actually changed jobs and is no longer really maintaining it. Um, and so it's one of those things where there's not a lot of documentation around it and uh, not too many folks who are well-versed enough to be able to review it in detail. Um, it does need a little bit of cleanups. Um, a lot of documentation as well would be helpful. Um, so that's still uh, some work to be done. Um, we also need a non-staging path for binder and logger. Um, I know uh, for logger, uh, some folks at Sony were working on it, uh, but I haven't heard anything recently, so I suspect that's kind of stalled out. Um, and binder as well, it's kind of a, a monster of a problem. Um, but apparently Greg Hartman uh, has recently announced that he's going to be working on a, a new uh, in-kernel IPC layer, uh, trying to merge some portions of basically the, the dbus functionality into the kernel. Um, and it's, I, I believe the hope is to make it so that it would be uh, something that Binder could be implemented on as well. Um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, also, again, all the small little miscellaneous items uh, throughout uh, uh, need, need minor cleanups and, and pushed upstream. So this slide's a little old, so hopefully I'm not missing anybody. Um, but I, I went through all of the upstream commits and basically uh, pulled out anything that was related to the Android patches and, and pulled out the patch authors um, and uh, have them all listed here. I've highlighted uh, in green the uh, Google Android developers, um, mostly to credit them for you know, the substantial original work that they've basically contributed here, um, but also to you know, show the contrast that there's quite a few folks in the community that's also helping, uh, albeit in smaller ways. Um, so thanks to everybody on the list, and hopefully, uh, you know, we'll see this list continue to grow. So folks wanted me to have some sort of color-coded status <laughs> to show kind of where we were. And uh, so this is kind of a, a rough swing at that. And so we have green for things that are upstream, uh, yellow for things that are in staging, uh, orange for things that people are working on, and red for things that are out of tree. Now, again... This is not uh, a very scientific, but it does show that you know, a good chunk of the work is actually uh, uh, up in the mainline kernel in one way or another. Um, and it also shows that there's a fair amount of work still to be done, uh, specifically in networking graphics and uh, power management. So for a little more data-driven analysis, uh, I went through basically the entire out-of-tree uh, uh, Android uh, 3.4 branch. Um, and that basically contains, as of last week, about 568 patches. Um, and it's 127,000 lines of code, or it's lines of change, which uh, is substantial. Um, so I decided to break that down kind of by directory. And the really surprising part, I know this is a little bit of an eye chart here, is that the, the huge 60% chunk there is the Broadcom driver. <laughs> so that's just the Wi-Fi driver. And it, it's, it's a vendor drop, and so it's not really... Um, it's not something that's being pushed upstream anyway. Um, and, and the second biggest item there is uh, uh, the YAFS2 file system. Um, and that, that, again, isn't super interesting for uh, uh, upstreaming. It's, but, I mean, again, here it's you know, something like 70% combined uh, of the lines of change. Um, so to get maybe a little more useful uh, uh, view of things, I dropped uh, the Broadcom driver and the YAFS2 uh, file system out. And that brings it down to 35,000 lines of change, which is definitely more manageable. Um, and we can see kind of the big chunks here are things like the, uh, uh, the Android gadget driver is the biggest, uh, followed by NetFilter. Um, we've got uh, a fairly big chunk of change in ArchArm, which is mostly the FIQ debugger. 
Um, we've got, after that, there's the ion driver. Um, header changes is next, and that's sort of the, that comes from all, all the changes, basically. Um, and then driver's base is also sync. Um, and sort of on and on and on, it gets smaller. The, the, the other thing to note is that there's a huge long tail. Um, basically, anything that was smaller than 1%, I just grouped into other, and there's just tons of them. Um, so it, it sort of uh, keeps going there. Um, so this chart, uh, unfortunately, isn't as cool as the amount of work it took to make it. Um, <laughs> but I'm still pretty proud of it. Um, basically, I went through all of the patches in the 3-4 uh, tree that are not upstream um, and charted them by their author date time um, and grouped them by their uh, uh, patch subject topic. Um, and so this is kind of neat because it lets you see uh, uh, kind of where the Android developers have spent their time um, over the last few years. Um, there's one change that's kind of a stray change way out here that's uh, from like 2005, before Android even started. Um, that they basically had pulled in uh, in the ARM directory. But um, you kind of notice through the middle here, it's a little more sparse. And part of the reason for that is, you know, they do periodic rebases, so every once in a while they'll squish a number of commits uh, into a, a single change. Um, but also the fact that a lot of the older Android uh, functionality is already upstream. And so it's, 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 there's less uh, uh, stuff that's out of tree uh, through these years. Um, I think the most interesting part is over here on the right where there's a lot of changes. You can basically see where they've been spending the majority of their time um, this last year. And so we've got a fair amount of changes in the ARM tree, a lot of changes in the CPU frequency uh, uh, governor, uh, especially recently. Um, there's kind of a, a whole bunch of changes in the net, but that, that's the Broadcom driver again. They just do periodic syncs with the, the OEM driver. Um, there's a fair amount of changes in the sync driver. We've got power, which is the uh, Android battery driver. Um, uh, GPU, which is ION, um, and then net filter down there is another uh, item. So I don't know. I, I thought this. I did, if, I, if I could do this again, I'd try to make some way to have the actual commits show the size of the patch set, but I think that would just be unreadable. Um, so I guess the point of that slide is that despite all the work uh, that's gone into uh, getting stuff upstream, uh, Google isn't standing still. They're still generating changes. Um, again, we have a fair amount of recent development around the Broadcom driver, ION, uh, SYNC, um, the interactive CPU frequency governor, and then uh, less in size, but uh, more, more recent changes have been also in the battery driver and net filter. And, um, you know, this to some extent explains in that earlier status chart why we had a lot of red on the bug droid around uh, graphics, uh, power, and uh, um, networking. And so um, it basically kind of shows, you know, those are the areas that we need to kind of focus on to catch up. So finally, um, you know, why, why bother with all this? Uh, uh, what does all this upstreaming actually do to help anyone? Um, so in the media or, you know, kind of uh, uh, web comments or whatever, you'll see a lot of people kind of grumbling of, oh, Google forked the Linux kernel and it's terrible gasp. Um, and yeah, you know, they, they forked the, the code, um, but that's the way Linux kernel development works. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things that people create these little areas and they make experiments and they see how it goes and then the maintainers can see uh, how those experiments go and if, if, you know, the code continues to be worked on, then clearly it's something that people care about and it's, it's, it's more likely to go upstream eventually. Um, we've had a lot of cases of this, of major work being done out of tree. Um, for example, uh, there's precedence of like the preempt RT, RT uh, patch set, um, which has some really core kernel maintainers uh, focused on it. Um, and it's been out of tree for the last seven years. Um, a lot of it has gone upstream, but they keep on writing more, and so it just kind of always stays uh, out of tree. Um, there's also other cases, like the 4 gig, 4 gig split kernel. Uh, this is something that uh, RHEL shipped in the RHEL three days. Um, and, and basically, it, it you know, was useful for 32-bit PAE kernels uh, when you had a ton of memory. Uh, but when x86-64 became more common, it, it became unnecessary. And so it was something that just was done for a while and then stayed out of tree. Um, in fact, most file systems are done out of tree for quite a while. Uh, you know, it's now kind of funny because ext3 is considered kind of this 
old stodgy stable thing. But for a while it was you know, too risky to merge upstream and so Red Hat had to carry it out of tree for quite a while. Um, and so you know, it's one of those things where the GPL, it, it allows for these forks to eventually be, remended, be uh, mended. Um, and, or at least if it's a bad, if there was a bad decision, we can learn from kind of the mistakes that were made. Um, so code forks, they aren't really an issue. Um, but community forks can be more problematic. Um, I guess, you know, in the upstream Linux community, there's already uh, kind of an existing issue of there's somewhat of a rift between x86 and ARM developers. And mostly that's due to kind of the historical aspect of a lot of the core uh, uh, maintainers being somewhat x86 focused. Um, and this is something Lenaro has actually been working pretty well to address. <laughs> Um, but when Android came on the scene and became such a huge force uh, for ARM vendors, um, basically this caused a lot of ARM developers to kind of go off and focus on getting the Android kernel working. Um, so much so that, you know, basically if, you know, uh, there's a lot of Android platforms that basically are shipping, or non-Android platforms that are shipping with the Android kernel. We've got the WebOS and Firefox OS, and apparently even the uh, Ubuntu phone is going to ship with the Android kernel. Um, and this is all because you know, the developers who are focusing on, this makes it even harder basically uh, for developers who are uh, uh, writing uh, uh, hardware enablement for their ARM boards uh, to be able to push stuff upstream because they're gonna end up with funny little Android dependencies. Um, and so basically by pushing the code upstream, um, it's important because it incre inc increases collaboration. Basically folks are able to interact with uh, the upstream maintainers. They're able to basically work with, you know, ARM, ARM folks are able to collaborate more with x86. They're also, ARM folks are able to collaborate with other ARM folks, where uh, otherwise they might be just keeping the stuff in private trees somewhere. Um, and, you know, it allows them to be able to find common solutions and, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, work together on things. Um, kind of the takeaway that I'd like for this is that, you know, if you're working on the kernel, it doesn't really matter whether or not you're doing, you know, uh, Android development or Big Iron development, um, I think you really should consider yourself a member of the upstream can, uh, kernel community. Um, maybe not a majorly influential member, but a member nonetheless. Um, the Linux kernel is kind of a shared commons that we you know, are all invested in, and I think we should kind of consider uh, uh, it as our community. Um, and yeah, you know, much like family, there is gonna be folks who will frustrate you and who will, uh, you know, kind of drive you crazy <laughs> at times and, and make life very difficult. But at the same time, the upstream kernel community can also be a really great source for help and feedback um, that would otherwise cost a lot of money to be able to get. Um, so basically join in. Uh, there's plenty of uh, Android upstreaming still left to do, uh, uh, but even outside of Android, uh, uh, if you're working on the kernel, please submit uh, uh, patches up to the mailing list uh, and kind of read LKML and join in in the discussion. And uh, also check out Lenaro's website here for other cool stuff that's going on. All right, thank you. <laughs>